Welcome, everyone. Dr. Saka is going to be doing the spectrum of angle closure glaucoma. But let me introduce Dr. Saka here. Dr. Joseph Saka is an attending optometric physician at Center for Sight in Sarasota in Venice, Florida, which is a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma and neuroophthalmic disease management. He is the residency education coordinator for Center for Sight. That's not where he stops. He's also the director of optometric business development for USI. He was uh, formerly professor of uh, optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years. Joe, was that 28 years and two days? 28 years and two days. All right, 28 years, two days where he served numerous academic wait. and administrative roles. Oh, wait. Yep. Dr. Salka is a founding member of both the Optometric Glaucoma Society and Retina Society. Phone, I... He is also the founder and uh, former chair of oh. Neuroophthalmic Disorders and Optometry Special Interest Groups for the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Salka is a glaucoma diplomat for the American Academy of Optometry in 2021 and 2022. He was ranked number four optometrist in U.S. Newsweek magazine, America's Best Eye Doctors. But number four wasn't good enough. In 2023, he was ranked number one optometrist in U.S. Newsweek's uh, rankings. Congratulations, Joe, on that. He is a partner and co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. Joe, the podium and virtual floor is all yours. Everyone, please welcome Joe with a virtual round of applause. Well, thank you, Greg. Well, we're going to talk the spectrum of angle closure glaucoma. Yeah, but I, it's, gonna... it's so small. What? <laughs> All Hold right. On one I'll, I'll start identifying them. There's that one. It's too small. Oh Got that one. All right. Should be good. All right. Well, as I said, we're going to go through the whole spectrum of angle closure glaucoma. And it's a lot more than just the ZAP study or the acute attack. Uh, there's really quite a bit to this, and I think we're gonna fill out the entire uh, hour and 40 minutes or two hours uh, as we do this. Uh, my only disclosure is I'm on the Speakers Bureau for Bausch & Loam. However, I have created this lecture myself independently. Uh, and as, as Greg mentioned, I'm a co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. So let's decide what is angle closure glaucoma. It's a very severe type of glaucoma that is caused by apposition of the iris to the trabecular meshwork, or in some cases, the cornea, and obstructs the outflow of aqueous due to forces at about four different anatomic levels. It can be at the iris, which is a common pupillary block, the ciliary body, which is a primary plateau iris, the lens, which is a phacomorphic syndrome, and other vectors that are behind the lens, such as malignant glaucoma. So you can see, as we go through these four anatomic levels, and these are not simultaneously, these are all leading to different stages or portions of disease, you're going to see what the spectrum is, and I think you're all going to realize you have seen patients who have had closed angles. I'm going to start off right off with a polling question. All right, patient's IOP is 28. Gonioscopically, you see no structures for 180 degrees and only posterior TM for 180 degrees. What is your diagnosis? Is this open angle glaucoma? Is this closed angle glaucoma? Is this narrow angle glaucoma? Or I'm not really sure. That's why I'm here for you to teach me. Which is a good answer. Don't we wish we had that that choice on national boards, Greg? Um, yeah, I think number four would be the would, would should be a passing one. And um, in Joe's disclosures, everything has been mit mit mitigated by uh, Cope. I'm going to share your. Uh, your uh, handout here, Joe. I believe I'm mm -hmm. going to share the handout here. And um, Teresa and Madge got my uh, references. It was the song Daniel by Elton John. Looks like we got about 80% rolling in. All right, I'm going to end the poll. I'll share the results. 
And Joe, you can deal with it. Well, looking at this, I mean, we have a few things, we have a few people uh, weighing in widely. And I think uh, it's probably easy to say, I probably didn't give enough information to answer the question uh, you know, thoroughly. You know, there, there is other information that I could probably give you. But there is one term I want, I want us to stay away from, and that's the term narrow angle glaucoma. There are two terms that we're going to strike from our vernacular. This is the first one. I will share the second term later. But narrow angle glaucoma is not a term that we use uh, in 2023 any longer. This is sort of an antiquated term that connotes a occludable angle. But the fact the angle is narrow doesn't give a person glaucoma. You know, the angle is either opened or it's closed. And we're going to look at the dichotomy of those two. Joe, it's still, really okay to, it's still okay to say someone has a narrow angle, correct? Yes, but we don't, we don't diagnose narrow angle glaucoma, even if there is an ICD-10 code for it. We can say the angle is narrow, or we like to say, because we're very sophisticated, it is potentially occludable. So our terminology that we're using now is primary angle closure suspect, which is a very common condition. Primary angle closure, which can lead to primary angle closure glaucoma. And the one that we always associate, though it's not really all that common, is a primary angle closure attack. So let's look at these all individually. Primary angle closure suspect are the patients we might be seeing on an even daily basis. The pigmented trabecular meshwork is blocked by the iris. Now, nobody really agrees how much, but I think we're at this point we're considering 180 degrees. If you have 180 degrees where you cannot see the pigmented trabecular meshwork, that is your true suspect. And we've learned a lot about how to manage these patients. Now, there is no synechia peripherally. Disc and pressure are all normal. Now, you may want to probe for symptoms of intermittent angle closure, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And we've never really been sure if laser iridotomy or observation is better. And I think at this point, we're beginning to lean toward observation and away from laser iridotomy. But old habits are hard to break. So we'll talk more about that in just a bit. Now, primary angle closure we're, we're getting into true disease. The pigmented trabecular meshwork is blocked by the iris for at least 180 degrees, and they have either peripheral anterior synechia or, and or elevated intraocular pressure. But as of yet, there is no disc or field loss and no OCT damage, but this is pathologic. And once we get to this level, so far it has been recommended laser iridotomy is the appropriate approach. Going further, if that status remains and the pressure is elevated, we can develop primary angle closure glaucoma, where the pigmented TM is blocked for 180 degrees by the iris. They have either sneaky and or elevated pressures, but there's also glaucomatous neuropathy and glaucomatous field loss and glaucomatous nerve fiber layer and gang cell loss. And again, LPI is going to be recommended for these patients. And finally, the rather uncommon primary angle closure attack, where there's a near complete apposition of the iris to the pigmented trabecular meshwork. There's no egress of aqueous out of the anterior chamber, or very little. And these are people who are very symptomatic. They have a red eye, vision loss. They may have headache or nausea and vomiting. Uh, corneal edema is very common. Uh, it's a, it's an Inflamed eye, very importantly, is a mid-dilated fixed pupil. When, when you see that mid-dilated fixed pupil not reacting to light, it's very, very diagnostic. Now, these are patients who are sequentially treated with medical therapy, iridotomy. We'll talk about iridoplasty, though it's not very commonly used. And sometimes even trabeculectomy, that puts a patient at risk for other complications, such as malignant glaucoma. Now, there comes a question is, do we do all these other things first, or do we just try to get the lens out and really solve the situation? And the answer is, it depends on the patient situation. 
And this is just something from the Doheny Eye Institute. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Getty, uh, Rich Parrish contributed to this. And this is just a table that kind of really summarizes what I just what I just went over. Now, angle closure glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness worldwide, and vision loss is more common in angle closure than primary open angle glaucoma. Now, out of the 7 million people who are blind from glaucoma worldwide, about 4 million are blind from angle closure glaucoma, and angle closure is not the most common form of glaucoma. So thus, it is a seen as a more malignant disease. Now, maybe I should try to look into the current stats of 2023, but it was estimated by 2020. I'm not sure this is, it has ever come to pass. Primary angle closure glaucoma would be affecting 20 million people worldwide with about 5 million people blind from the disease. Now, what is a typical patient profile? It is more common in Caucasians than patient, uh, patients of color. Uh, it has been said angle closure is uncommon in patients of African descent, but I can tell you I have seen it. It does indeed happen. Uh, in Asian patients, angle closure glaucoma is more common than primary open angle glaucoma. More common in females, uh, in older individuals, and obviously more common in hyperopes who have smaller eyes. And the Inuit population actually has the highest incidence uh, of angle closure. So when anybody, when I was teaching the students and residents at Nova, and we discussed angle closure, we try to tell people. You know, I try to tell people what is a typical pr patient profile, and it's all the F's. All right, the the patient is 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 female. She is farsighted. Her feet don't touch the footrest. You know, a small person who's got small eyes who's hyperopic, moderately to highly hyperopic. These are patients at risk. And these, when they come in, we always, we always think about when my technicians come to me now in practice and ask me about uh, patients, if they're safe to dilate, the first question I'm going to ask is, what is their refractive error? And I'm not looking for an exact, but tell me, are they farsighted? Are they emetropic or nearsighted? I know nearsighted is not really all that common, though it does happen. But farsighted, we have to be a little bit more worried about. So class of angle closure, we have primary angle closure with and without pupil block. We have secondary angle closure without with and without pupil block. And I can't un understate the importance of knowing what is the status. Is it? With pupil block, is it without pupil block? Is it a primary disease? Is it a secondary disease? And if you know that, you'll be able to work through the management of these patients properly. So really there's four main classes. So I'm gonna spend the, a bit of time on primary angle closure with pupil block. We'll talk about the acute, subacute, and the common chronic form. And pupil block is a normal physiologic phenomenon. Only in a rare few patients does this become uh, pathophysiologic. It becomes pathological in some patients. In most other people, it is physiologic. If you have your lenticular, your, your own lens, you have your own crystalline lens, you've got pupil block. It just isn't pathologic. Right? Pupil block is normal physiology. Only some are going to develop pathology. This is where the iris and the lens are in the tightest apposition. And this is about the mid peripheral state, mid dilated state. There is an absent uh, pathway for aqueous to get into the anterior chamber. It leads to a buildup of pressure in the posterior chamber. And this causes the iris bombay or bowing forward of the iris due to this pressure buildup give you an irritable trabecular, or in some cases, an irritable corneal apposition with subsequent closure of the angle. And this is what I'm describing here. This, this is a just a tight apposition, this, uh, this artist rendition. 
in the mid dilated state, that apposition between the anterior lens, the posterior iris, is the tightest. For most of us, aqueous just percolates right through. In some people, that apposition becomes so firm that aqueous does not diffuse out well, leading to iris bombay, and, a secondary, uh, and secondarily, it goes into angle closure. Now, this has always been relieved by laser iridotomy. So when we're looking at patients, we've been taught the von Herrick technique of looking for that narrow angle. And yes, and I've got a depiction here of a, what appears to be a narrow peripheral angle. Caveat, I've seen deeper peripheral angles uh, in patients who have closure. And I've seen angles that look like this when gonioscopically, I can easily see all structures. So this is really a screening technique only. Probably more important is to look at what's happening in the mid peripheral or central part of the of the eye. Here we've got a very normal situation. You can really appreciate that deep chamber. We're not looking just right over here. I'm looking more in this area. We're going to have no problems with this patient. But if we look at up someone like this in the mid peripheral, we can see the very close uh, relationship between the iris and the cornea. And certainly when we go in the pupillary zone, we can see that there is almost a flat or collapsed anterior chamber here. So it's not so much what happens in the periphery at the limbus. It's kind of what's happening in the mid part of the eye and how deep is that chamber. That's really more telling as to who is going to be in angle closure. And gonioscopically, we may not be able to see over a very, very steep volcanic-like uh, iris. We have no structures there at all. There may be structures, we just can't gonioscopically see them. Now, one thing I've been finding is anterior segment OCT can give us some information. It's a nice adjunct that I confess I don't probably do enough. It sometimes doesn't come to mind. Uh, about half of these cases end up getting an anterior segment OCT, uh, and the other and, and out of those half, uh, usually about half are it would be my recommendation to get it, or the other half comes from my technicians. They see a, a narrow angle, they just run it for me. But this kind of gives a good uh, good idea of what is the corneal lenticular relationship and distance. You know, what is the relationship between the lens and the iris? What is the status of the iris in the periphery? All right, do we have any opening here? But this is a snapshot, one cut across. It is not a replacement for gonioscopy. It's a nice adjunct. It gives a lot of information, but I can't tell what structures are there. Now, we start looking at some of the potential iris uh, lens configurations. Here is our nice classic iris bombay. We got quite a bit of distance between the back surface of the cornea and the anterior, anterior surface of the lens. But the iris is really bulging forward, and that's an iris bombay. And we certainly have very few structures. Of course, we're going to want to do gonioscopy. Very, very similar, something like we have here, a shallower chamber with a bit uh, of Bombay, very similar to the one I see over here. This is a different animal entirely. This is not Iris Bombay. If we look at the relationship between the back surface of the cornea and the front surface of the lens, we have a fair amount of distance here. We have virtually no distance here. This is most likely not a pupil block situation, but this is something more akin to uh, uh, a, a malignant type of glaucoma or something where the choroid has been become uh, detached or engorged. So very helpful to look at the iris, the lens, the cornea, the relationship, and the overall status to help make our diagnoses. So these enough. are all, yeah. Nope, I was just going to Go say ahead. in that fourth image, is that an IOL implant? It's hard for me to tell. That could very well be an IOL. And yep. that could be something that's post-surgical. And yep. there are there are different causes that we're going to go through. Great.
perfectly. So a primary angle closure, if people block, if that stays closed, you're going to have a problem because peripheral anterior sneaker forms relatively quickly. Now, we have all used meiosis as a standard to both hold the iris out of the angle, but anything that breaks that pupillary block, gets that iris off of the mid-dilated state, is going to help. Now, believe it or not, a cycloplegic agent can sometimes be used. And in some situations, a tripicamide or even an atropine may be a medication of choice, but many doctors are uncomfortable dilating a patient who's already in angle closure. But we're going to go through and look at some examples where that's actually important. But historically, we have done that meiotic approach. The pressure can rise significantly, 40 to 70, my general belief or my experience, it's usually a 50 to 60 range. Uh, question is, are we going to get a, a vascular occlusion due to the elevated pressure? The answer, I've never seen it. I've had patients whose pressure has been so high, it's immeasurable not develop a retinal vascular occlusion. So that's not really a consideration for me. But the synechia complicates things because if the attack is not uh, broken in a reasonable amount of time, which means a day or two, that's going to become permanent, and that changes how we are able to manage these patients, and it makes it more surgically complicated. So what are the anatomic features of people with pupil block? Well, they've got a smaller corneal diameter, a smaller axial length uh, compared to age match controls, they, their actual length is about 5% shorter. They've got a moderate degree of hyperopia, somewhere between the 150 to 250 range. And their lenses are thicker, uh, usually about 7% thicker. And this is leading to, you know, due to cataractogenesis, leading to a phacomorphous. And there's a greater propensity for the crystalline lens to move, to rotate forward, leading to this pupil block. They have a shallow anterior chamber. Now, if the anterior chamber depth is more than two and a half millimeters, and we can now assess this on OCT, you almost never see angle closure. If it's between two and 2.5 millimeters, sometimes you see angle closure. If it's less than two millimeters, you frequently can see angle closure. And most of the angle closure eyes have an anterior chamber depth less than 1.5 millimeters. So using your anterior segment OCT, you can measure this and see what the risk is. The anterior chamber is about 25, 24% shallower than age match control and about 37% less volume in the anterior chamber. So these are people with smaller eyes, the hyperopes. So looking at acute, subacute, and chronic, the acute one is the one we always worry about, but it's probably the least commonly uh, encountered angle a primary angle closure glaucoma. These are people that may present with a moderately red eye. They tend to be photophobic. There can be some degree of corneal edema depending on the severity and acute nature. And because of the blurred vision, uh, the corneal edema, they're going to have blurred vision. And once in a while, patients can complain of nausea uh, and maybe vomiting. And the reason that this happens, it's almost like a vasovagal syncope reaction. The corneal edema, which is pretty sudden of onset due to the sudden pressure elevation, can disturb the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve can lead to nausea and vomit. When somebody vomits a lot, what we have to worry about is they can become dehydrated. This is the body's attempt to lower the fluid volume. So when they're vomiting, it's trying to lower the intraocular pressure. The pressure is going to be elevated. And I can't tell you, it, it's just a fixed mid-dilated pupil. It's, there's really no reactivity at all. There may be a mild anterior chamber reaction. Uh, it can be difficult to see into the eye because of the corneal edema. And once in a while, you may actually see this necrotic lens capsule called glaucoma flecken. Uh, I, when I was teaching a glaucoma course, I actually, uh, I never really even taught this. I mean, it, 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 it was such a rare phenomenon. And then uh, one year I, I, I caught some heck because it was on the boards. It was on NBEO, glaucoma flecken. 
And this is that necrotic lens capsule that occurs due to a sudden, severe, abrupt pressure elevation. I can tell you right now, I have never seen glaucoma flecken in angle closure. This example I'm showing you here was a uvedic glaucoma, but the same, same, same issue, acute pressure elevation. So glaucoma flecken, if you see that necrotic lens capsule, that may be an eye that has undergone or intermittently undergoes angle closure. Now, one may wonder if the cornea is so cloudy, how can I put a gonial lens on and and assess the angle? The answer is you try, but you may have difficulty. In that situation, the easiest thing to do is to go and do gonioscopy on the other eye. If this is a primary angle closure, the fellow eye should be in a situation where it is at risk of closure. If you are looking at a fellow eye and it's a very deep chamber with, with profound angle structures, you shouldn't consider that we're dealing with a primary angle closure situation. Maybe secondary, but it's probably not a primary. But these are mucky eyes that can be very, very difficult to, to see through and, and get a good assessment. So this is a situation where pretty much the entire angle is involved. Uh, it is an acute situation. These people can lose nerve, nerve fiber layer, and visual field in days if the attack is not broken. And their symptoms tend to be somewhat profound, and they're, they're difficult to, to examine. My experience has been the... The uh, the mid forties to maybe sixty is where the ILP tends to to land. Corneal edema because the sodium potassium pump shut down from the elevated intraocular pressure, and again, synechia will form quickly, and they can we can have a pro, uh, a chronic ILP elevation even after breaking the tack because it can lead to trabecular meshwork damage. I'm going to uh, take a quick look at uh, the questions here, Greg. Uh, I've Mainly, seen a couple of iris bombay on posterior yeah. chamber IOLs. In one case of a sort of backward iris bombay with anterior chamber IOL, that's actually more common, Richard, the reverse iris bomb, or it's, it's an iris bombay, but the, the blockage is in the anterior chamber. And it's that usually because somebody forgot to put it in iridectomy. And that glaucoma flecken dude is on TikTok. Yeah. The NBAO sometimes, I think, is just a optometric trivia contest. So manage acute angle closure glaucoma. One, keep your head. All right. Just, you know, keep keep relaxed. You know, put a beta, you know, use a beta blocker. You know, you, you should have some, some samples. A beta blocker. You know, a drop may be separated by 10 or 15 minutes, but don't don't keep, you know, dropping it in. And you know, don't go more than two drops. Uh, you're going to supersaturate the receptors. Before you know it, grandma don't breathe so well. You don't, you don't want that happening. Pilocarpine 1 or 2% if the pressure is under 40. Now, if it's over 40, the iris is ischemic. It's not going to work. But make sure you've got the right diagnosis. Don't be pouring pilocarpine into a, a red, painful, high-pressure eye that, that has uveitis. So make sure that you, you have the right diagnosis. And you know, don't go anything higher than, than 2% because it, it can actually worsen it. It can lead to sorry body congestion and lead to a, a greater pupil block. And no, I don't think viewity in a situation like this is going to help you very much. Now, do we need iapidine? I don't think there's anything really magical about iopidine. You know, we use iopidine to blunt uh, post-laser ILP spikes, but I don't think it's any better than alpha again. Uh, I use iopidine to test for Horner's syndrome, but I would use a alpha again or a combigan in this situation just as well. A steroid, if you have one available two or three times, will help with some of the inflammation. Prostaglandins tend to work too slow. They're great for chronic angle closure, but for acute angle closure, yeah, I know the eye is inflamed, but putting a prostaglandin in is not going to hurt the patient, but it's not really going to help them either. And they just tend to work a little too slow. And carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, 500 milligrams uh, in office, 
maybe uh, send them home with some Diamox. The sequels tend to work a little too slowly. Uh, the, a short-term use is going to be safe for a patient. If, if they can't use oral and or you don't have it available, a topical be, can be used, but it's not going to be uh, it's not going to be as effective. You know, we always have uh, a supply of Diamox. We we get post-op or uh, pressure spikes, so we have Diamox in the office, and uh, it's very easy to give it to the patient. Uh, two pills in the office and two pills for later. Now, I know we used to use oral osmotics. Uh, if anybody has, an, yeah. You know, it, 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 you can put it in the chat rooms. They may have an os like glycerin in their office. I think one time I went to I went to find some glycerin for a patient. I want to see how much it in there. I, sh I shook the bottle and it, it like rattled, you know, rattled like a Morocco. So if they're available, but we usually don't have them and don't use them. Joe, I think it's worth saying, and you might have said it, is that, you know, that's the beauty of the, you know, the iopidines, the alpha GANs, the, uh, they're the alpha agonists is that they do work quick. You know, most, you know, mm -hmm. alpha GAN products, whenever you read them, they're TID dosing. I think most of us probably use them BID, but that's the idea is that those alpha agonists, they work quick, but then they wear off quick. And they also have a high allergy rate. You know, and I, like you said, Joe, I think, you know, there's really no difference probably between iopidine and alpha GAN other than iopidine has a higher contact dermatitis delayed and that's why we just don't see it used that often it's just kind of short term yeah it has a tachyphylaxis it doesn't last for more than three months that's why in our office we, you know we all we always have some diamox and i've got a small supply of cosop pf you know it's very it's very easy to give a couple of vials of cosop pf you know these are things that work pretty quickly Laser iridotomy has always been what we've done on these patients. Uh, iridoplasty is something that can be done. It generally isn't. It is not a. It is not a very effective procedure and somewhat uh, uncomfortable. And in severe situations, these patients may need a trabeculectomy or two, but this actually puts them at risk for something called malignant glaucoma. And there's a very very high incidence in flat chambers after a trabeculectomy. Now, it can be argued that maybe the best thing to do is, you know, break the attack and just get the lens out. You know, if you remove a crystalline lens that may be cataractogenesis and very thick and intermescent, you take that out, put an IOL in, and you've got all the space in the world. You know, the caveat is, you know, surgeons don't want to do that. You can't get good surgical measurements when a person's in the attack. So I think a good, a good rule of thought is you can break the attack Try to get it, get the lens out. That that's really going to solve the problem. But iridotomy disequilibrates the pressure between the anterior and posterior segment, allows the aqu uh, aqueous egress. The iris can relax backwards, hopefully exposing the trabecular meshwork. Hopefully, there's not too much peripheral anterior synechia there, and that the exposed me meshwork actually still does work. Now, we've historically had them placed superiorly and through some optical means that I still can't uh, explain. They seem to have fewer visual issues uh, if it's put at the three or nine o'clock position. So that seems to be where we've now shifted to, putting things in the, the three o'clock and the nine o'clock position. And I think the Do answer have, to that, to yeah. that, Joe, is that you know when the patient's tear prism is sitting right there, and you you're, you kind of maybe have it in that one picture, that up, but the tear prism kind of you know reflects the light through that superior, uh, and then then it gets some glare. So by mm -hmm. putting it three and nine, it gets that tear prism effect and doesn't allow that that light to go up through there. Yeah, it's kind of funny because, and, and I'll, I'll, I, I think I buy that, Greg. I mean, I know that's the explanation. I think, I think that uh, I, I buy that, or it may be something else. Well, but, you know, I actually got, played. It, I actually played around the other day. I had a patient come in, and I said, "You get any glare?" And they, you know, we kind of, what are you talking about? And I lifted their lid out of the way, and they're like, "Oh, okay, I see what you're talking about." Put it back down. Played around. So, I mean, it has something to do with that lid, with tear prism, maybe whatever, but. You know, I did have, you know, because that's where they used to put them. I have a lot of patients with them at that, you know, anywhere from that, you know, say, uh, 
you know, one o'clock, 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock position and was playing around with it. And moving that lid around does get rid of, uh, does get rid of that, that, that extra image, I guess. And it, it kind of says something when, you know, it was very fastidious that you had to have the iridotomy under the upper lid or you're going to get visual distortions or glare issues. Now we've gone a, a completely away from that. But you can certainly see that after iridotomy, it's going to give you some more room there and it's going to relax the iris back uh, quite a bit. Caveat, it's got to be a pupil block situation. Otherwise, iridotomy doesn't work. Now, here's what is more speculative than anything, the subacute attack. I don't know if I actually put this on an assessment more than a couple times in my entire career, because a lot of this has to do with a symptomatology that sometimes you're, you're grasping at. These are people who have recurrent attacks that spontaneously subside and resolve. You know, when they go to sleep, their pupils will myopes, and it tends to break the attack. And these are people who may have lesser symptoms, episodic blurred vision, halos uh, around lights, maybe that uh, they, they have di difficulty watching TV in the dark. And this is maybe a partial and intermittent angle closure, and what you're going to be looking for would be sneaking because this is a, a kind of a chronic situation. And you're particularly looking for synechia superiorly because that's where the angle is narrowest. This is, has been incorrectly called narrow angle glaucoma because the angle is chronically narrow. Well, it is narrow, but that doesn't cause the issue. It's when it goes into closure. So sometimes this can also be confused with a normal tension glaucoma or primary open angle glaucoma because people have a, see a reticence to do gonioscopy. But somewhere in your initial evaluation, we've got to put, put a gonial lens on the patient's eye. So this is pretty much the same way, you know, lens removal is going to be very helpful, a laser iridotomy. But long-term medical management alone is probably not a, appropriate because that synechia will progress and will become a little bit harder to, uh, to manage. Now, of course, patients can only go actually glaucoma surgeries, but again, there is a risk of malignant glaucoma. <laughs> now, here's a 59-year-old asymptomatic female, complains mildly blurred vision, mild discomfort in both eyes, but it was really ocular surface disease and dry eye. And this was a routine examination. She's 20-20 correctable. Her pressure is 38 and 42. Uh, on biomicroscopy, very, very narrow angles, barely uh, any anterior tr trabecular meshwork in fairly both eyes. And we can certainly see her visual fields, uh, very, very uh, progressive field loss. So otherwise asymptomatic, a little ocular surface disease, not in acute distress, elevated intraocular pressure, uh, virtually no angle structures noted on gonioscopy, and she's got what appears to be some fairly advanced disease. So that brings me to question number two. What is this patient's diagnosis? Is it open angle glaucoma? Is a closed angle, acute closed angle? Is it chronic closed angle? Is it narrow angle? Or I'm not sure. That's why I'm here to learn. Seem to be caught up on the questions, Joe. I did no, put the hand. Me. I put the handout mm -hmm. in at eight fifteen, but I'll put it in again in case some people rolled in after that. And Richard said the anterior chamber eye was, was a bad surgical technique, and that's kind of really how it uh, how it happens. You know, interesting. I, re I remember seeing a uh, a patient uh, some time ago when I was at at university, and it was an older woman, and she was there with her daughter, and her daughter was a really good historian, 
And she was saying how that she was on, her mother was undergoing cataract surgery and they are having difficulty getting, you know, and she said, getting the lens in the bag. I mean, she's able to say all of that. She So her daughter really picked up a lot of things. And I took a look and I couldn't tell if it was an anterior chamber aisle or posterior chamber aisle. It's like he couldn't, it seemed like the surgeon couldn't decide, just kind of put it in diagonal, but it gave a kind of a, a, a relative pupil block and angle closure. So what's the most likely diagnosis? The majority of people are saying it is a chronic angle closure glaucoma. And I would agree with that. And this is actually the most common form of primary angle closure glaucoma is chronic. 80% of primary angle closure is chronic disease. Only about 20% is acute disease. It is generally an asymptomatic patient that we find on routine examinations. And there's a zippering shut of the angle. There's a lot of synechia. It usually begins superiorly and does progress circumferentially around. And this is often mistaken for primary open angle glaucoma. And why is it mistaken for POAG? Because people don't do gonioscopy. So at some point in your evaluation, doesn't necessarily have to be on your first day. We need to look at the structure of the angle with gonioscopy and if available, anterior segment OCT. It's actually, it can actually be very helpful. Now, this is a multi-mechanism disease. It is only partially pupil block. It is mo mostly a creeping angle closure. Now, pupillary block gives you Iris Bombay. That's more common in acute or subacute disease. But we have a non-pupil blocking mechanism here. There's some pupil block, yes. I will, I will acknowledge that. But these patients with chronic disease usually have a deeper anterior chamber, and that's where the mistake for primary open angle glaucoma comes in. You think it seems deep. We don't need to do gonioscopy, but we still do. They tend to be a little bit on the younger side, and it's mostly an iris crowding mechanism. There is an anteriorly positioned psoe body against the iris root to the angle. There is some degree of pupil block, and yes, iridotomy will be done on these patients, but it is a multi-mechanism. It's pupil block. It is a synechial creeping angle closure. It's iris crowding mechanism, and it's an anterior, anteriorly located psoe body. So managing these patients, iridotomy will be done to relieve whatever pupil block may be, be, be there. And there are a lot of times that iridotomy is done, but is of minimal help. And the reason is, sometimes we just don't know how much pupil block is really there. Iridotomy is a relatively benign procedure, pretty easily done. And you just don't know how much it's going to help in some situations. Sometimes you know it's very clear. In other situations, you're not really sure how much it's going to help. We do the iridotomy. Maybe it doesn't help a lot, but you just never know how much true pupil block is there, despite your best gonioscopy and anterior segment OT, uh, OCT skills. But a lot of these patients are going to require medicines afterwards. Uh, lensectomy is actually being investigate as a primary treatment for chronic angle closure. It's probably the best thing to do. It's a very viable option. We learned this from the EAGLE study. And let's talk about that. The EAGLE study looked at patients with primary angle closure glaucoma with disease, pressure over 21, or they had elevated intraocular pressures with primary angle closure, but may have not developed yet. And what they did is they enrolled these patients into studies. They randomized them into two interventional groups. One standard group went the traditional treatment. They underwent a laser iridotomy and, if necessary, medicines, and, if necessary, true glaucoma surgery, you know, kind of a stepwise approach. The other group, they immediately went under, underwent lens extraction with fake emulsification. And I want to point out, these were clear lenses. These, this is clear lens extraction, not cataractus, clear lens. And if the disease was not, was not controlled, they underwent medical therapy. 
And if their disease was not controlled, then they underwent glaucoma surgery. So standard of laser and drops versus just get that lens out, even if it's a clear lens. That was the Eagle study. And what they found that people who had their lenses removed, obviously they needed far fewer ILP meds after, after surgery. Only one person needed, you know, went on to trabeculectomy after FACO, whereas 24 patients after LPI ultimately had to go, they failed medical therapy, and they had to undergo trabeculectomy. And few, far fewer meds after FACO than after LPI. So it was pretty clear that removing the lens and chronic angle closure is actually very beneficial, probably the best treatment. Now, if there is a cataract present, it's very simple uh, management. If the lens is clear, it becomes more challenging to uh, get, get that lens out just for insurance coverage, despite the information here. Usually surgeons have ways to, to get that, you know, to get the patient qualified. But if it's an absolutely clear lens, uh, more likely than not, insurance still will not cover it. Other surgical treatments, phaco gonia synechia lysis, where the lens are removed and the synechia is not so much surgically cut open, but the surgeon will press down on the iris all around where she or he can, can get to and try to separate the iris from the trabecular meshwork. Now, they're trying to restore function in this previously closed angle, but there's a lot of features that may even not allow this to happen. The angle may open up after going to synechial lysis, but the meshwork may still not work very well. So theoretically, it makes sense, but few actually perform the procedure as part of their treatment for primary angle closure. More likely than not, if the, if the cataract surgeon is also fellowship trained in glaucoma, she or he will do that. Uh, most uh, comprehensive ophthalmologists probably will not go that extra step. So originally polling question number three, can you dilate a patient who's in chronic angle closure? Yes, no, I'm not sure that's why I'm here. Pretty simple. If a patient's in chronic angle closure, can you dial it? Hey, Greg, I think I'm, I'm caught up. Kind of question. Yes, you, yep, yes, you are. Nothing's in there. And polling question if you're like, well. And... <laughs> Okay, people are weighing in. I'm not saying should you, I'm saying can you. Yes, no, or I'm not sure. I think uh, we're, they're all done. Majority say, yes, you can. Some say you can't, others say, yeah, I'm not really sure. And the answer is, yeah, probably. You know, you, 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 pro you probably can do it. I'm not saying you should, if you know that, but I can tell you it's happened before. Maybe that patient you see and you think it's primary open angle glaucoma, you do your dilation and you didn't know. Oh, I can tell you, I had many patients referred to me in the glaucoma service when I, when I was at university, and I know they had a primary eye exam elsewhere or even in our general care clinic, and they had been dilated. There's really no ill effects because it's not strongly pupil block. So the answer is, if you make the mistake and dilate them, and it turns out they're chronic angle closure, you really haven't hurt them. So don't worry about that. It is not a big oopsie. Now, a patient with chronic angle closure undergoes laser irid uh, iridotomy successfully. Angles open to scleral spur. Immediately after the procedure, the pressure drops down to 19, no meds. At a three-month follow-up, pressure is 27. Six-month follow-up, pressure is now 35. What's going on here? That brings me to 
polling question number four, what's happening with this patient? The LPI is not patent. The angle closed again. The patient has mixed mechanism glaucoma. None of the above, or I'm not sure, that's why I'm here. So I'll go back to the information. Chronic angle closure, successful LPI, pressure drops, angle opens. Then over the course of six months, pressure creeps back up pretty significantly. What's happening? The LPI not patent, they closed again, has mixed mechanism glaucoma, none of the above, or I'm not really sure. Is there anything you want to add, Greg, or anything I'm missing here? No, well, pretty, pretty good to this point. I've been throwing my comments in as uh, as you've been going along, and mm -hmm. a little bit of a tougher question, but a very, very important lesson to learn here. And, and this will say, if when you learn this lesson, you'll save you some grief. All right. LPI is not patent. It's always a possibility. In this case, it was. Angle closed again. Now was, the LPI was still patent. Patient has mixed mechanism glaucoma. That was a favored response. That's a very common diagnosis. Uh, none of the above. That's a good one. I'm not sure why I'm here. It's always, that's, that's why we're doing this, so people can learn. I kind of like the, I'm in the 5% uh, none of the above category. And let's talk about mixed mechanism glaucoma. The trabecular meshwork is what I, is a very delicate structure. It's what I call a hothouse orchid. If it doesn't have the right temperature, sunlight, and humidity, it's going to wilt. Now, you've got an iris that has been rubbing up against it. That's going to lead to a scarring and sclerosis of that meshwork. Now, don't try to look at it gonioscopically. It's more histologic. That meshwork is not likely going to work. That's a common thing to find. So if you're wondering what's happening, it is trabecular dysfunction from appositional closure. That's why it goes up. Now, I've heard the term mixed mechanism glaucoma. I've heard that a lot in my training. And I ask, you know, what, what does that mean? And the you know, people who use this have, have said, well, they had, pro they had angle closure glaucoma. They're treated successfully. Then they developed primary open angle glaucoma. They went from one type of glaucoma to another type of glaucoma. That is really unlucky, if you ask me. To me, that's like being struck by lightning while being eaten by a shark. If you ever saw the movie The Revenant with uh, with Leo DiCaprio, imagine like, he gets attacked by a grizzly bear and is laying there. Then he gets attacked by a polar bear. This is really bad luck. No, they don't have primary open angle glaucoma. There's a good there's an ICD-10 code. I don't know what it is. I don't remember what it is, but residual stage angle closure. Anybody who uses tells you the term mixed mechanism glaucoma is really telling you the pressure is high, but I don't know why. That's why it's trabecular dysfunction or residual stage angle closure. It's open. Mesh is not going to work. They're going to need medicine. Good medicine to use. Prostaglandins. Prostaglandins don't work well in acute angle closure. They work very well in chronic angle closure, both before and after LPI. It has actually even been shown to be effective in patients with complete peripheral anterior synechia. Now, what the mechanism is, we have, no, we have no good explanation, but I can tell you from the literature and my own experience, prostaglandins work very well in chronic angle closure. Because Azrani is big on mixed mechanism. I don't like mixed mechanism. I, I, I would say I would say multifactorial. Now, prophylaxing for angle closure. We're going to talk about LPI in just a bit. 
We want to look at gonial to see if there's any reversible or irreversible closure. Remember that gonial is a pretty poor predictor of the risk of angle closure. It's a pretty static view of a dynamic phenomenon. And there's intra and inter observer variation. And you know there, there are a lot of people out there with small eyes, but only one person might develop angle closure. There are other things that are involved We'll talk about the choroid role in just a little bit. And always remember, iridotomy does speed cataract. So that's hey, a Joe, I, that's I do I do have a, a comment to make, um, yeah. if mm -hmm. it's okay at this time. Mm -hmm. um, last year when I was in San Diego, um, I was hanging out with a, with a glaucoma MSL medical science liaison. And he was with one of the companies. And he actually did his PhD intrabecular mesh work. And I learned a lot. I geeked out with them, believe it or not. And um, you know, trabecular mesh work is, you know, is 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 a small tissue, but it's a viable tissue that is there for, you know, it's got receptors and that's what these prostaglandins and different molecules plug into. Um, you know, that's what the uh natarsidil product kind of expands that actin and myosin. And it, it's a living tissue that whenever you, you know, start lasering it or, um, you know, it starts to get compromised, uh, maybe from antioxidants and oxidative stress, not antioxidants, but the oxidative stress, but crushing it with a high pressure, you know, it's a tissue that might just get damaged. And that's why some of these, you know, treatments, like you said, might not work because, you got to have a living, viable trabecular meshwork, again, to get that aqueous to Schlem's canal and into mm -hmm. the collector channel. So just that was my comment, just to remind as you go through all these different classic uh, spectrum of uh, angle closure. Yeah, that's excellent. I'm, so, I'm sorry I missed that conversation. It sounded uh, pretty invigorating. <laughs> <from the cocktails. laughs> yeah, well, it was, it was actually, I thought, going to be boring, but it turned out, you know, me being the geek that I am really helped mm -hmm. out with all these receptors and everything that's out there. So now let's consider continue our spectrum with a common and unrecognized, often unrecognized condition called plateau iris syndrome, which is primary angle closure without pupil block. <laughs> And this is a eye that's got a relatively deep chamber, but a narrow angle because anatomically, it's got a very large last roll of the iris. And it's a crowding phenomenon. Aqueous can get from the posterior to the anterior chamber very easily. But as the patient or the eye pupil dilates, it can lead to a physical blockade. Now, laser iridotomy occasionally helps. We don't know why, but generally it doesn't. Like I said, we never know how much pupil block is, in, is there. Argon laser iridoplasty is a irritable retraction procedure using a, a thermal laser, which has some degree of efficacy. Uh, it is not a long-term situation. It's a relatively uncomfortable situation, and the, uh, the, the impressiveness is just kind of not really there. And this is just the, uh, an artist to picture. We have a last low, low roll of the iris. Aqueous will get through here very easily. There's no iris bombay, but the position of the ciliary body uh, and the last roll of the iris can lead to a, a blockage. And this is the one that really we get into trouble with when we pharmacologically dilate them because it does block the area. And here's some nice, and, and this is like about the anterior segment OCT, because it does give you a lot of information. You may not be able to appreciate gonoscopically the structures that may or may not be there. And I said, this is just one cut uh, through the eye, but you can appreciate that large last roll of the iris causing the problem. You can see, it seems like there's an apposition here, but there seems to be some opening here that maybe aqueous can percolate through there in some parts of the angle. Now, gonioscopically, there's the double hump sign, which is hard to appreciate. And I certainly have a hard time showing it to you on a flat, uh, flat image. But as you do indentation gonioscopy, there is a hump over the iris here. Then it bows backwards. We're, remember, we're pushing on the, on the cornea with a... a uh, Zeiss 4 mirror uh, 
gonio lens. Now it dips back down, and then we have this large roll here. So there's kind of two rolls with an indentation in between, and that is called a double hump sign. Very hard to show you on a fat, flat slide, but we go over here, there's indentation going on. The iris is being forced backwards, but you still have this long, large last roll of the iris. And this is an example, and here's maybe even a better example of an iridoplasty, where a long duration, low powered uh, argon laser will burn the tissue here. These are not holes. These are not uh, like iridotomies. What happens is the laser causes the tissue to contract. It contracts the collagen and it starts to pull it out of the angle. Almost if I had to give you uh, an analogy, you got that bathing suit with a drawstring Get, gets pulled, you're trying to pull that drawstring back out in your bathing suit. Almost the same thing, you're trying to pull the iris. Uh, it tends to be only fair in terms of efficacy. And a lot of surgeons just aren't doing it. The patients don't like it. This was probably, this it was this injection is probably due to the procedure. It is not a comfortable procedure to undergo. And that brings me to the stuff that we know about uh, recently, the ZAP study. The ZAP study looked at using laser iridotomy prophylactically in those primary angle closure suspects. And this was a very, I think, very sophisticated study where they looked at about 900 patients in Junction, uh, China. And the reason it was done there is that is where they found a lot of primary angle closure. So what they did is they took patients and they randomized the eyes with the fellow eye being the control. So nearly 900 suspects, the one eye, you know, these are people who had blockage of the trabecular meshwork for at least 180 degrees, but there's no, there's no pressure elevation. There's no glaucomatous damage. They're the true suspect that we see very frequently. One eye got an eight laser iridotomy. The other eye was observed. This was done randomly. And what they want to do is look at six-year results. And their, their goal is to see which eyes had an endpoint of a pressure more than 24, at least one clock hour of peripheral anterior synechia, or they had an acute attack. And what we learned was, yes, laser iridotomy did significantly, by about 47%, reduce the risk of developing uh, angle closure disease. However, when we take a look at the number of eyes that actually got into trouble with true disease, only 19 treated eyes and 36 untreated eyes developed disease. And when I say disease, most of these patients develop synechia. They are still asymptomatic. So while the laser iridotomy was very beneficial in preventing angle closure disease in mere suspects, the rate of developing disease was actually very low. So their conclusion was, it's hard to justify using LPI. Now, caveat, this is a population in China. These, these are all patients uh, of Chinese descent. That may not be applicable to everybody. But what we're learning is really very few of these suspects got into trouble. They even looked at pharmacologic dilation in patients with angle closure suspicion. They found post-dilation pressure elevation is similar if they had an LPI or they didn't have an LPI. And angle, uh, acute angle closure was very low even in those eyes that had not been lasered previously. So their conclusion is you don't really even need to do an LPI before you dilate these patients. And it's not recommended. Now, caveat, today's practice if you have a patient who has retinal disease and will be dilated periodically, that's a suspect that probably should undergo iridotomy. But by and large, the ZAP study showed us that 
not many people truly who are suspects truly get into into trouble and it's hard to justify even though it's beneficial it's hard to justify the widespread use of lpi now that being said old habits are hard to break and today soon 2023 most ophthalmologists when confronted with a patient like this will still probably undergo or or, or, or perform an lpi an optometrist uh, who are laser certified will do an LPI. Now let's go to the recently result or uh, released 14 year results. Now ZAP was a six year study, but they still had data and they still follow patients for up to 14 years. And, that, and this information was really just uh, recently reported. Now here's a caveat about 43% uh, were lost to follow. That's pretty significant. So we have to look at these results with a degree of uh, caution. But after 14 years, out of the patients that are able to follow for that long, 33% of the LPI treated eyes developed disease, and 105 untreated eyes developed disease. Now, what was disease? An acute angle closure attack primary angle closure with synechia, glaucoma, or elevated pressure. So the numbers go up, but if we look at true disease, either acute attack or true angle closure glaucoma, not just synechia, which is asymptomatic, only 12 eyes got true disease over 14 years. Caveat, they did lose a lot to follow. So we have to be aware of that. So... Acute angle closure, one LPI treated eye underwent an acute angle closure, five untreated eyes underwent ankle closure. Developing pressure elevation and true glaucoma, chronic, two LPI treated eyes developed it, four untreated eyes developed it. So a very low population of eyes got into true disease trouble. I'm, I'm not talking about just asymptomatic synechia. Now, the LPI treated eyes had worse cataracts, had higher pressure, but it had a greater anterior chamber depth. Now, subsequent paper came out and said the eyes most at risk post LPI are the ones who still had persistent narrow angles on going oscopy and OCT. So, LPI is not always a panacea. There are still maybe eyes at risk even after undergoing LPI. All right, patient, 74-year-old female, blurred vision, both eyes, plus five, some cylinder, plus 550, 2060 and 2020. Pupils are reactive, no afferent defect, pretty significant cataract in the right eye, accounting for 2060 acuity, left eye not quite so bad. Pressure was 30 in each, uh, uh, 30 in the right eye, 25 in the left, very narrow angles. Now, going escopically, I saw no structure in the, in the right eye. Left eye, a little bit of anterior TM, otherwise no structure seen. Uh, no view undilated. We did an OCT, and we see what she looks like here. Very, very narrow angle. We don't really have any Iris Bombay here, and this, I think, is the... Uh, probably the higher pressure eye, pretty intermescent cataract, and a very shallow chamber. So what is our assessment and plan? Our approach, I think pretty clearly, is a primary chronic angle closure. Now, does she have glaucoma? I didn't see the optic nerve, didn't do a visual field on the first visit nor did we do an OCT. But she's got primary angle closure. She may or may not have glaucomatous damage. It's hard for me to tell. I sampled her with a prostaglandin, sent her for a cataract consult. Nothing urgent. When she gets to her consult, her pressure is 17 in each eye, which underscores excuse me, how well prostaglandins do work for chronic angle closure. Uh, glaucoma surgeon made surgical me uh, measurements. He didn't dilate either. Plan cataract extraction with a basic amotropic outcome, right eye first, left eye, continue medicines. Unfortunately, patient canceled surgery twice, don't know why. 
loss of follow-up, or as I say, you can lead an angle closure to uh, to osmoglin, but you can't make them drink. Now, here's another case where I got backed into a closure corner. And this is something, uh, a patient I picked up uh, sort of midway in her, in her care. She was a 30-year-old female referred to our practice in 2018 before, uh, before I got to our practice for narrow angles. She has a low to moderate hyperopen HI, gonioscopy. She was quote-unquote slit-like, grade one. Uh, as recorded in the chart. Pressure is 18, diagnosed of primary ang as a primary angle closure suspect. Pretty straightforward. Plan was to do an LPI. LPI is done, no appreciable change afterwards. So really no change occurred. Uh, she's still grade one, no synechia, double hump sign. At that point, our glaucoma surgeon diagnosed her with plateau iris syndrome. Plan, he discussed iridoplasty, pilocarpine lens extraction, ultimately recommended observation, but said other glaucoma specialists may have a different approach. You're welcome to get a second opinion. Oh, by the way, don't start any new medicines without, and without getting clearance from our office, meaning no cold or allergy medicines. All right, all is well and good. This 2018, 2022, I am now- Hey, Joe, can you, can, you, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? You know, I get Which questions part? all the time because, you know, 50% of the practice, or I don't know, whatever, 40%, 50% of my practice is glaucoma. And we get those questions all the time. Hey, I was reading that. Can you elaborate on that, just why the why that is? Yeah, because in the decongestants, uh, there may there may be a vasal uh, a, a sympathomimetic medicine that can lead to a mild pupillary uh, dilation that can theoretically lead to a pupil block, could theoretically lead to angle closure. Now that's a lot of stuff to put on a a cold medicine warning. So the simplification is they say the, they say. Glaucoma, you can't use it. Now, that being said, if you know a patient has open angles, they can use all the cold medicine that they want. But it's just the theoretical risk of pupillary dilation and uh, and angle closure. Yeah, and the majority of the patients that come in too, you know, have glaucoma. They're usually, most of them are older, had cataract mm -hmm. surgery. So just like Joe mm -hmm. said, the primary open angle, great. And then on top of it, they're pseudophagic. Take it all you want. Yep. So she comes to me for an emergency evaluation with what's clearly an, a migraine aura. I don't need to dilate her to uh, make this diagnosis. There's a history. But we looked over the records and realized there's no resolution to this issue. And she did forget about the medication admonition. She actually used cold and allergy medicines uh, in the four years since. She had been to other doctors who told her she can never be dilated. She's worried. She doesn't know what to do. So what do we do? Can this 30-year-old go the rest of her life without dilation? I think we all agree that's probably not a, a good approach. The options really aren't great. Pilocarpine in a 30-year-old is going to give a lot of visual symptoms. Irritoplasty, yeah, not a pleasant or nor long lasting type of treatment. That's not great. And we're going to do a lens extraction on a 30 year old. And we certainly, insurance is not going to cover it. And if we're doing a multifocal lens that allow her to still read, because we're taking away all of her accommodation otherwise, you know, that's an out of pocket expense of about $12,000 for a problem that may not really even exist. She hasn't had an attack in four years. So I actually go to what I heard Harry Quigley talk about at one of our glaucoma society meetings. He said, you don't know. You just don't know who's going to get in trouble. So sometimes you got to bite the bullet, dilate, see what happens. But you don't do it Friday at four. You do it Friday at nine. Tell they're going to be here until lunchtime. So that's what we did. We had a long discussion. And uh, I set her for the following Tuesday morning for a, a dilation. And to her credit, you know, I explained to her, I said, look, 
I'm going to dilate you. You may actually develop a problem. You may need emergency surgery. Are you up for it? She said, sure. So she comes back Tuesday, 8.30. Her pressure is 22. Informed her risk, dilated with a half percent trypicamide because I wanted a weak, mid-dilated pupil. I wanted the worst I could get it. Diamoxin come again. We're ready. Trust me, it works. At 9.30, pressure was 22. I said, look, you don't have to sit here all day. Go about your business. If you develop a problem, come back immediately. Otherwise, come back after lunch. Comes back at 115. Pupil is in the worst possible mid-dilated state where I wanted it. Pressure is 22 and 23. No change. Fund is normal. 2C ratio. Everything is fine. Educated sign symptoms at acute angle closure. And we'll follow her annually with a dilation. She knows to come back because if there's an issue, she knows we can take care of it. So that's a lot of stuff. We got the primaries. Now let's start talking about the secondaries. Secondary angle closure with pupil block and secondary angle closure without pupil block. Secondary angle closure with pupil block. It can be a plethora of things. It could be uveitis with posterior synechia. It could be phacomorphism. A fakia with vitreous prolapse, pseudophakia from an ill placed intraocular lens, reverse pupil block from an anterior chamber lens, as, as Richard talked about earlier, or even a sublux uh, crystalline lens. And this is what I'm talking about pupil, secondary angle closure with pupil block. Here's an anterior chamber IOL. You can see the iris just bulging wherever it is, and because they ain't doing iridotomy. Here's a patient who's got intumescent cataracts with phacomorphism and a pupil block. So there's a secondary condition that's causing pupil block and secondary angle closure. Probably the best example I came across this, and if you understand this, you really know glaucoma. He's a 50-year-old male, comes in for a comprehensive eye exam, 2040 in each eye. He's minus 18, give or take, in each eye. Very, very high myope. Pressure's 42 in each eye. He's got constricted visual fields on confrontation, glaucomatous disc damage, and there are his optic nerves. And the answer, my friend, is not blowing in the wind, but the answer to what's going on is right in front of us. What is wrong with this picture? And Keith asked, sector dilation of top, cotton tip plunger. Now, let, let's just go ahead and do a complete di dilation, Keith. So put in the chat room, what is wrong with this picture? I mean, it's advanced glaucoma atrophy. But there's something that doesn't fit this clinical picture, which is the key to the diagnosis. Anybody want to put it in there? In the chat room? What might be wrong here? Okay. We don't want any dead air. You're not, you know, some people are not really sure. This is an, oh, I guess something in the chat room, what does it say? No parapapillary atrophy, Charles. That's probably the close, closest we're going to get. These are not minus 18 diopter myopic eyes, are they? Where's the staphyloma? The answer is it is an axial myopia. This is a person who has got, uh, well, let's see, what is, what is our polling question number five? What is the diagnosis here? Is it primary angle closure, open angle glaucoma, phacomorphic glaucoma, some weird syndrome that I learned in school, but I can't remember right now, or I'm not really sure that's why I'm here. Charles and Thomas, you're right. Lack of myopic degeneration is very key to this. So here's an 18 diopter mile who doesn't have any myopic degeneration who has got very elevated interocular pressures.
And I think due to this is a hard one due to time. I'm gonna I'm gonna call this one right here. And the majority say phacomorphic glaucoma, and that's exactly right. Gonoscopically, there's a chronic angle closure. How does a minus 18 diopter myope have angle closure? Well, the lens was protruding slightly into the anterior chamber. This was actually a patient who had phacomorphic glaucoma due to a small round lens, also known as microspheral phacia. So his angle closure, his glaucoma, and his myopia were all caused by a small round lens. And in fact, when I look, when I actually, so if I, no, I don't think I have it in here. When I, when I did an A scan on him, he comes out normal at about 24 mil. He's like slightly hyperopic. So this is phacomorphic, phaco lens, morph shape, shape of the lens. Usually it's an intumescent cataract. As a patient undergoes cataractogenesis, we have to watch them because they can go from an open angle situation to a closed angle situation. Now, occasionally it is not due to an intumescent cataract, but microspheral fakia, which can be a little syndromy, and this can be an acute or chronic angle closure in eyes with the high myopia. So high myopes can undergo angle closure, just not for the typical reasons that we think. So moving along, secondary angle closure without pupil block. Either the peripheral iris is pulled or pushed into the cornea. Aqueous can get from the anterior to the posterior, you know, from the posterior to the anterior chamber. No pupil block, but there's something else going on. This can be drug-induced choroidal expansion, neovascular glaucoma, which is the most common cause, neoplastic diseases, uh, inflammatory conditions, and ciliary block. Here's what I call the glaucoma upgrade. I just saw the patient probably two months ago, maybe a little bit longer time flies when you're having fun. He was a 76-year-old male who just got out of the hospital. He went from the hospital to my office. And he even hospitalized for three days with blood pressure, 220 over 140. Now, he had a Zen implant for glaucoma, for pseudoexfoliative glaucoma, about two weeks earlier. He's, already, he's still on post-operative drops of Durazol and moxifloxacin, has a painful right eye, can't wait to get out of the hospital to come to see his eye doctor. I mean, makes me wonder, why didn't he just say, you know, get a consult in, in the hospital? He's there. So as soon as he walks in, I take a look at him. Hard to, hard to examine. I, I, I examined myself. I didn't let my technicians do it. And as soon as I saw him, you know, it is a fixed diet, a mid diet, a fixed pupil, wasn't moving anywhere, mild corneal edema, pressure was 60. And this is what he looked, this was a fleeting glimpse that I, a glimpse that I got. I think I did a gonioscopy, no structure seen, obviously. This was a fleeting glimpse that I got uh, from the OCT, very hard to examine. I would say this is angle closure. I mean, the angle is, is over here somewhere. This is irritocorneal contact. So he actually has a very, very flat chamber. So what is the genesis of this problem? His pressure elevation due to malignant hypertension, pupil block angle closure, steroid-induced pressure elevation from Durazol, malignant glaucoma, or I'm not sure that's why I'm here. And thanks for doing that poll for me, Greg. Yep, I had a little delay, how to end the other poll in a sense and get this one ready, so. So he comes right from the hospital, right to the office, walks in, help me, help me. He had been hospitalized with very elevated blood pressure. 
<laughs> had glaucoma surgery two weeks ago for exploitative glaucoma, still on his medicines, moxie and durazol. Fixed mid dilated pupil pressure 60. I'm going to say his, his vision was probably hand motion or count fingers at this point. Probably should put that detail in there. And we see he's got a good degree of irritoconal contact. All right, all right, all right. It's a ch mm -hmm. challenging one, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end the poll as we share the results. It looks like we got a pretty good split in here. The the leader by a nose is malignant glaucoma, and that's actually what the uh, condition was. Also known as sorry, block glaucoma or aqueous misdirection syndrome. Aqueous is now being misdirected, often as a result of an ocular surgical procedure, typically a glaucoma surgical procedure, where now aqueous is being directed not forward but retrograde into the vitreous. There is an abnormally impermeable vitreal face. It blows up like a water balloon, and that's what we have. Malignant glaucoma. Call malignant glaucoma because it sometimes is hard to diagnose and very hard to treat. There is no benefit from iridotomy. It's not pupil block. Myotics are not going to help this. This is an anterior displacement of the iris and the ciliary body. There's a swelling of the ciliary body. There's an annular di displacement, detachment of the ciliary body, and the anterior vitreous is all moving forward. So this is a, a forward moving condition. So mostly misdirection aqueous in the, uh, into the vitreous and posterior chamber. Most commonly after ocular surgery for angle closure, I said he just had a Zen implant. Now, trabeculectomy and tube implants are more common, but a Zen can do this as well. And this is pretty unresponsible to convention, conventional glaucoma therapies. And this is essentially what happens is the, eye, the, the vitreous is ballooning up, aqueous cannot get out, it's forcing everything forward, collapsing the anterior chamber, which is exactly what we saw right here. It's a, it is not Iris Bombay. It is not a narrow angle. It is a collapsed chamber. Now, there's a number of things you can, they can try to use a disruption of, of, the, of the capsule by a YAG laser, maybe pop that water balloon. But generally speaking, what's going to happen is there. You know, he, he also had he had an interocular lens, uh, I think, w which was loose from his exfoliation syndrome. Generally speaking, these are patients who are going to need a, a vitrectomy. So this patient diagnosis was very straightforward. I'm going to help. I'm going to help you out right now. I'm going to give you the clinical pearl. How did that? You think I've never seen this? I'll never see this. If I do, I'll never be able to diagnose it. Yes, you will. Here's the clinical picture. They're all about the same. We had a couple more recently as well. The patient usually has had ocular surgery. Typically, it's some form of glaucoma surgery. Now, in glauco after glaucoma surgery, you can have a shallowing and flattening of the chamber for two reasons. Overfiltration leakage or malignant glaucoma. Number one, the chamber is flattening, the, the chamber is shallowing, and the pressure is low. That's overfiltration or that is leakage. Now, if the, if the chamber is flattened and the pressure is high, it's malignant glaucoma, done. It's that simple. So it's what's happening afterwards. Now, what I do is get all the meds. You know, he's got he's on a steroid. I added some P meds, whatever I had available. Uh, Gramadea Diamox, and I sent him to see our glaucoma surgery the next day. I also atropinized him. Did I put that in? Oh, I, could, I should put that in. I also added atropine, which is what we need to do to relax this. 24 hours later, his pressure was down to 32. There is no irido contact at that point. 
He ultimately underwent pars plane vitrectomy through a relatively protracted follow-up. His pressure is at 17, and I think his vision has improved probably to about the 2060 level. <laughs> when would an anterior ta chamber tap be indicated? Probably not here. It's not really going to do much. You you can you can lower. But see, you can't even get at times. You can't even get to the limbus. You, know, you go through the limbus. You're going to be going into the iris, and you're going to have a hemorrhage. So I should probably should add atropine was very important here. Put him on. Patient uh, ultimately underwent a vitrectomy. Got better. So malignant glaucoma. Post ocular surgery, usually glaucoma surgery, shallowing flat pressure or uh, chamber, uh, no iris bombay, pressure is going up, malignant glaucoma. Add some diamox, atropinizin, put them on steroids, going to help very, very significantly. Now, I asked earlier about have you know have you seen angle closure glaucoma? And thirty five percent of the People who responded said they had not. But if you've seen neovascular glaucoma, you've seen angle closure glaucoma. This is closed angle. This is a closed angle without pupil block. Aqueous can get into the anterior chamber, but there is a vascular synechial closure of that angle. There's rubiosis. The angle becomes vascularized. Uh, the vessels will have a fibrotic connective tissue scaffolding, which will zipper shut the, uh, the angle. So neovascular glaucoma, if you've seen that, you have seen angle closure. You just have to open, open up your, your, your understanding that that's closed angle. That's a secondary angle closure without pupil block. Now, these are people who have a relatively poor prognosis due to the glaucoma, also due to the uh, underlying ischemic disease to the retina, be it uh, diabetes or, or vascular occlusion. So this is the poster child for secondary angle closure without pupil block. These are patients who are under, going to undergo anti-VEGF injections and pan-retinal photocoagulation to destroy that ischemic retina and reduce the basal proliferative substance being released. So neovascular glaucoma, it is a closed angle situation. Medical treatment, atropine and steroid for the inflammatory component, uh, aqueous suppressants until we can get them a more definitive treatment, such as anti-VEGF and PRP with a retinal specialist. But yes, this is a person who needs atropinization as well as a steroid. I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit. The ICE syndromes, irritocoinal endothelial syndromes, where these abnormal endothelial cells are over-secreting decimase membrane, migrate migrate over and will actually cause a contraction. These membranes will contract. This is actually a coronal endothelial disease, which can be end up with a with a closed angle glaucoma. There's no pupil block, but these membranes that are being formed in essential iris atrophy or Chandler syndrome or Kogan Reese syndrome, this, these are coronal diseases that have abnormal decimase membrane, and membranes are going to form over, cause a contraction and a synechial angle closure. Again, ice syndrome, if you've ever seen ice, you've seen angle closure disease. Now, I'll talk about a few things. There are, there are factors that will affect the choroid, and there are drugs that can cause angle closure glaucoma. This is where I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up. There are a number of things... Believe not, even acetazolamide, which is a glaucoma medicine, can actually lead to an angle closure situation. Uh, trimethoprim can do it, spir spironolactone can do it, Viagra can do it. But the medicine that is most commonly associated with acute angle closure from a non-pupil block approach is Topamax or Topiramate. The pyramate is an anti-seizure medicine, which is used off-label for 
headache, weight loss. It is used for mood stabilization. It is used to reduce the psychological dependence on alcohol. It probably has more off-label uses than it has on-label uses. But this appears to be a self-allergic response that will cause a secondary angle closure. There's an anterior rotation of the ciliary body. When this happens, it reduces the tensions on the zonules, the lens thickens, and the key is it induces myopia. And not just a little bit of myopia, but a lot of myopia. Uh, hyperopes can become myopes, emetropes can become minus four, minus six diopter myopic overnight. And there's a shallowing of the anterior chamber, no pupil block. This is actually an angle closure without pupil block. When we have this sulfur allergic response, we have this swelling congestion of the ciliary body. It moves everything forward, shallows the chamber, it leads to an angle closure. I think this is a very nice diagram explaining what happens here. And we look at the patients, they have flat chamber, not Iris Bombay, flat chamber. So gonioscopy is very helpful, as well as your OCT to see what is the depth of that chamber. But biomicroscopically, you're going to see that iris almost draped on the cornea. I'm going to start wrapping up here. Case, 39-year-old female, recently started on Topamax for migraine. Has a sudden onset blurred vision and eye pain, formerly emetropic, now a six diopter myope. And what usually brings them in is a new onset vision loss. And her pressure's in the mid-40s. What is the best management for this patient? Is it cycloplegic and steroids? Oral diamox? Cosoft and Lumigan? Immediate, immediate LPI, or I'm not sure that's why I'm here. 39-year-old bilateral, bilateral angle closure, recently started, started on topiramate, shifts significantly myopic with a pressure elevation. What is the best management for this patient? Cycloplegia and steroids, diamox, cosop and lumigan, immediate LPI, or I'm not sure. Teach me. All right, we're doing very well. So I think for the sake of time, let's end the poll and share the results. And most people say do a cycloplegic and topical steroid. And that's how we're going to approach something like this. So the best approach, because this is not pupil block, this is a sulfur allergic response, most likely causing congestion of the ciliary body, forward rotation of the ciliary body, maybe even a, a choroidal effusion, ciliary effusion, is relax the eye. Stop the topamax, add a steroid of some sort, a cycloplegic of some sort. If you're ambitious, you can use a pressure-reducing medicine. Stay away from diamox. Diamox can actually worsen this if this is self-allergic. Stay away from Diamox, stay away from LPI. Unfortunately, there are a lot of patients walking around with holes in their iris because this mechanism was not well recognized early on. They get LPI and it did nothing because it's not pupil block. This is actually very easy to manage if we recognize it. The key here, first off, the medicine. It is not a buildup. You know, when I worked, when I worked at uh, at the university, I had a, I had a colleague who had a patient. She was regaling me that she had a patient on Topamax, and said she was going to be doing gonioscopy every three months on this patient. And if that uh, angle begins to narrow, she's going to get an LPI done right away. So that's all great, but it's all wrong. It doesn't build up. It's usually after the first dose. If it doesn't happen within a week, it's not going to happen. 
I've come across situations where doubling the dose caused it, but it's immediate. And it tends to be bilateral. Unil primary angle closure is generally unilateral. So bilaterally, flat chamber, just there the medicine, we know what we have. LPI, no. Diamox, no. Cycloplegic, steroid, yes. And this is what we look at. We can see at, at initial presentation here, uh, we use the proper treatment, stop the medicine. It resolves. Pressure comes down relatively quickly. Angle opens up relatively quickly. Induce myopia relatively slowly. That may take a couple of uh, may take up to a couple of weeks to resolve, from my experience. So that's a lot of stuff right there. I'm gonna. I see. I'm kind of out of time. We we went almost coast to coast on the spectrum of angle closure. I'm gonna say if I, if I were to redo the poll, I would I would venture to say nearly everybody would say, yeah, I've actually seen some sort of angle. Oh, Greg's gonna do it. So have you ever had a patient with angle closure? Not knowing what we know about angle closure now, yes or no? And Joe, while that poll's going off, um, that last case you have, I want everyone to kind of think of it more as an, an allergic reaction of the choroid, and that's why mm -hmm. it comes all leaky, and that's why the steroids work. You know, Joe mentioned about, you know, allergy to Diamox. If someone's allergic to maybe uh, uh, true soft or another carbionic anhydrase inhibitor, they're going to be allergic to Diamox. But here's the trick. If someone is allergic to an antibiotic, a sulfa antibiotic, it doesn't mean they're going to be allergic to the sulfa and the diamox. Um, don't want to get into a long drawn out study, but uh, a discussion, I mean, but the sulfa antibiotics, there is an amoyity on it um, that is what it's allergic to. It's not the S in sulfa. So if they're allergic to it, if, to a sulfa antibiotic, that's why a lot of times you're able to say, hey, why am I using Trusopt or or, I, or not Iopatine, but uh, um, Azopt uh, and Diamox, and they're not having any problems. They're not really allergic to the S, the sulfa in the antibiotics. There's an amoyity on there. And the third one, Joe, and I'll let you uh, comment and I can comment. It was a direct question. And um, the, the, the doc basically said, Please forgive me uh, for the silly question. And I want to remind everyone, there's no silly questions out there. The only question that's silly is the one that's not asked. But the question, Joe, is, but do you feel comfortable dilating a patient with narrow angles after they had an LPI? Yes. And I don't think, and, Greg, I don't think the polls, I don't think the last poll is working. Oh, but the, oh. do I feel comfortable dialing a patient after an LPI? The answer is yes. And at this point, I feel pretty comfortable dialing even without the LPI. Just understand that there can be an issue and be prepared to uh, to address it. So now, now it seems to be working, Greg? Yep, I relaunched it. I must have bumped something and all just kind of scrolling down here. Oh, it flashed for a couple seconds. Uh, I didn't get the poll either. Okay, sorry. My fault. It's up and running now. So mm -hmm. have you ever had a patient with angle closure? And Joe, I think Knowing we're that. going to be pleasantly surprised that, uh, you know, the before and after question, uh, the before mm -hmm. and after worked, and it goes to show that online CE can help people. I'm going, to end, I'm going to end mm -hmm. it. You're going to see because. So when people think about the entire spectrum of angle closure and that ice syndromes and medications and neovascular glaucoma are all manifestations of angle closure. Yeah. Actually, I've seen it, didn't really actually realize it. But it's important to know primary, secondary, with and without pupil block. Once you figure that out, you'll be able to manage these patients. So I'm going to turn to, I, I think I am all done here, Greg. Yep. And I put up the uh, questions and thank you. Uh, looks like we've answered all the questions. Uh, let me scroll down one last time. Yep. And so Joe, you're getting your virtual round of applause. Um, but somebody I did thank ask me uh, how often is paracentesis done these days? Uh, it depends on the situation. Um, paracentesis is done. 
in our retina practice when they're injecting the anti-VEGF medications. So managing angle closure, that we can we can do it without. Yeah, I guess actually, if you do a paracentesis for an angle closure, it's actually going to make it worse because you're taking more fluid out and you're going to move everything forward. So um, maybe burping a, you know, it's not really a paracentesis, but burping a wound after cataract surgery, that will help out. That's really not pupil block. Um, so, so with that said, Joe, thank you very much for doing uh, the spectrum of angle closures. This was a synchronous, synchronous a virtual course. Uh, and, uh, and we'll thank Vanessa for being our conference administrator and COPE administrator.